Bug Thesda, the former sweetheart of the gaming world. They could do no wrong. We let them off the hook so many times. Question is though, did they deserve to get that many passes or are they finally getting the wrath that they deserve? Hello, my name is Roan Farrell, and in this video, we are going to go ahead and go through the wild and crazy history of Bethesda. Before we begin, I want to first off start by welcoming you in, and I do want to go and give you a bit of a disclaimer. I was, am, and always will be a massive Bethesda fanboy. I've been playing their games ever since I was a little lad, pooping my dieties. But keep in mind, everything I say here does come from a deep love of the company, as well as a nice dose of sweet, sweet, nostalgic bias. So let's go ahead and begin. In order to understand this company, we need to first explore the very first game they ever made, and the one that actually almost sunk the company. Don't you do it. Don't you dare say like the Titan. Like the Titanic? Oh God, what an idiot. Back in 1994, Bethesda unleashed the Elder Scrolls Arena upon the world, and oh boy did it give them a rocky start in the game development world. Believe it or not, Arena was not even supposed to be an RPG, or even an Elder Scrolls game. Nope, it was originally envisioned as a medieval gladiatorial combat game. Picture this, you're assembling your team of fierce arena fighters and traveling from town to town, engaging in epic battles. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, when the folks of Surtech, another game company, were pitched the idea, they laughed so hard they probably fell out of their chairs. But you know what? Vijay Lakshman and Ted Peterson from Bethesda weren't ones to back down. They basically said, hold my beer, and started plugging away at their little gladiatory simulator. We have actual footage. Here, take a look. Are you not and just like that, the plan was underway. The plan at first was simple, okay? So you have this band of squad. You go from city to city, all the way until you get to the Imperial City. You defeat the next squad, and you become the Grand Champion. We'll return to that later. But as the excitement built for this game, they thought, let's put some side quests in. Brilliant idea, right? Well, the side quests ended up being a lot more entertaining than the actual game. So they are like, this arena biz? Throwing that out the window. No longer are they doing the arena. It's just too bad they already did a copyright for the name. Now, creating a full-blown RPG is no easy task. Bethesda knew they needed some extra firepower for this ambitious endeavor. Enter Chris Weaver, the ultimate fanboy of the game. Bethesda brought him onto the small development team, knowing his passion would be a driving force. This game was like his baby, and he poured his heart and soul into it, giving birth to many of its unique mechanics. But hey, a game isn't complete without rigorous testing, right? That's where a young and eager Todd Howard enters the picture. Picture this, the fresh-faced Todd Howard stepping onto the scene, ready to put this game through its paces. Little did he know he was about to become an integral part of Bethesda's journey. Todd would soon leave his mark on the game and the company, becoming an iconic figure in gaming history. The stage was set and these passionate individuals were about to make gaming history together. Now, Todd's role within Arena may have been small, but it was vital. He had the prestigious responsibility of scouring the game for any bugs that may have been able to crawl their way in. So let's go ahead and take a moment and really appreciate the result of Todd's hard work. As you can see here, our friend Mr. Howard let very few... I'm still going. Ooh, that's a lot of bugs. Arena was originally set to release December 25th of 1993. Talk about a sweet spot on the calendar, right? Just imagine all those eager gamers ready to dive into some epic adventures once they were done returning their unwanted gifts. But hold on tight, my friends, because here comes the unfortunate twist. It got delayed. Yep, four whole months. <sighs> to add insult to injury, when Arena finally hit the shelves, it only managed to sell a meager 3,000 units initially. Ouch, that's a far cry from the success that they had hoped for, especially when comparing it to their less than stellar Terminator game, which actually sold circles around it. In fact, Ted Peterson, one of the minds behind Arena, couldn't help but voice his concerns. He said, and I quote, we were sure we screwed the company and we'd go out of business. Talk about a nail-biting moment for Bethesda. They were standing at the edge of a precipice, unsure of what the future held. Little did they know that this setback would merely be a stepping stone in the remarkable success they would achieve in the years to come. 
One piece of advice that my father has always given me is that he would rather be lucky than good. And in Bethesda's case during this time period, they were both. Not only was Arena competently put together and a very entertaining game, it was also released during a role-playing game drought. Inevitably, eventually people found the game, loved it, and spread the information about it word of mouth, which ended up having the community rally behind the game, identifying the great features of Arena and really being a lifeline for the company so they could release another title within this series. After weathering the tumultuous development cycle, the release cycle and the profits of Arena, Bethesda steeled themselves, made sure that they were not deterred from revisiting this franchise. Ted Peterson took the reins on the next game for this franchise and named it Daggerfall. Armed with the experience of creating the arena game as well as with a clearer vision on an RPG focus, they were able to go ahead and avoid major conflicts within the development cycle of this game. In the early stages, Daggerfall was originally intended to be a direct continuation of Arena, forming a cohesive trilogy. I'm going to stop you there. They did try to describe this as being akin to the Might and Magic games, but I understand I barely get that reference. I highly doubt any of you even know what that franchise is. So let's make it more akin to the Mass Effect series 1 and 2 and 3, where you could just take your character progression through each of them. However, plans took an unexpected turn as Bethesda decided to undergo a major overhaul in character creation and progression. They bid farewell to the arena's experience-based system and introduced a revolutionary concept allowing the players to progress based on how they role-played their characters. It was a breath of fresh air, enhancing immersion and providing players with unparalleled customization options. But fear not, my friends, for the class system remained intact. Bethesda offered the option to create your own class, inspired by the renowned GURPS or generic universal role-playing system. This change marked a significant change in the landscape of RPGs, opening the doors to even greater immersion and personalization. Little did we know that this trend would continue to shape the future games in the series, making them even more extraordinary. Let's think back to the release of Daggerfall. That was smooth sailing, right? No, <laughs> no, Bethesda, in a true signature move fashion, stumbled upon a game-breaking bug in the very release of Daggerfall. As you can imagine, this infuriated the customer base. Now, I will give Bethesda credit. They did own up to their mistake, provide a free patch for anybody that would send in for the code, and also promise to do better in the future releases and have a better timetable. And they've been taking that promise to an extreme. It's been 12 years since the last entry since we have had an Elder Scrolls game. I blame you, ESO. While Daggerfall may not have had a direct modding support that later entries in the series enjoyed, it did spark the growth of a vibrant modding community. These passionate individuals breathed new life into the game, creating a plethora of user-generated content that extended the game's lifespan long after its initial release. The emergence of this modding community became a defining feature of the franchise and the company, injecting fresh ideas, quests, and enhancements into the game world. Bethesda may not have anticipated this phenomenon, but they quickly recognized the value it brought to their titles. The impact of Daggerfall went beyond the modding scene. It struck a chord with gamers across the nation, shipping an impressive 120,000 copies to stores nationwide upon its release. This success solidified the Elder Scrolls series as a flagship title for Bethesda, establishing its rightful place in the gaming industry. And just like that, we are out of the 2D sprites graphics and moving into 3D with the title Morrowind. Now, Morrowind has a very special place in my heart. Although I have played all the Elder Scrolls game, Morrowind was and always will be my first. Talk about a life-changing experience. If I never played that game, I probably wouldn't be nearly as nerdy as I am today. So thank you, Bethesda. Now with Morrowind, Bethesda did leave and go into uncharted territories. No longer were they going to use procedural generation. Will I ever go through a video without talking about procedural generation? Probably not. One fun fact, though, about Morrowind is it actually was the idea in the original pitch for the story of Daggerfall. However, due to limitations, they decided to push it off until the Xbox series until the third game. And I feel like that was a really great choice. Oh, dear sweet Jesus, this age like shit. Time has not been kind to the graphics of Morrowind. It aged like milk, like it was left out in the scorching sun. But let's not dwell on that too much, because Morrowind did have some great ideas to offer. There's a captivating storyline, 
revolving around a menacing blight that threatens to obliterate all life on the magnificent continent of Morrowind. Our valiant hero, the Nerevar, must confront and defeat the notorious Dagath Ur to put an end to his calamity. It's an epic quest filled with danger, mystery, and the fate of an entire land hanging in the balance. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Originally, the intention was to have the disease spread to each city, potentially causing their destruction in the process in-game. Now that's some next-level storytelling and game design. Imagine the stakes and the tension this would have brought to the game. Sadly, technical limitations held back this ambitious vision. We were still rocking the good old Xbox at the time, and technology wasn't quite ready to fully deliver the grandeur of Morrowind's concept. But hey, let's not get too downtrodden, because Morrowind did have its moments. Despite the limitations, Bethesda managed to incorporate some impressive water effects. Oh yeah, look at that water, it's positive. Wet! It may sound silly, but hey, we took what we could get back then, and those water graf graphics were the bomb. Marwind had two big additions to the series. The first one we're going to talk about is the Elder Scrolls Construction Kit. Say that five times fast. <laughs> the Elder Scrolls Constructions Kit was a promise from Bethesda that they were going to keep modding open and free for the Elder Scrolls Marwind because they knew that was going to make the game better and have it have more longevity. The second announcement they were going to do was that this was going to get a release on the Xbox, the original Xbox, not Xbox One. Let's not confuse that mess. This did mark a partnership with Microsoft that we will actually get into later. Morrowind also marked the beginning of Todd Howard's directorial debut. And oh boy, did he make a splash. Following the footsteps of Daggerfall, Morrowind continued the tradition of being an instant hit. It skyrocketed in popularity, becoming the 62nd best-selling PC game from January 2000 to August 2006. But that's not all, my fellow gamers, because Morrowind achieved something truly remarkable. Are you ready for this? Brace yourselves. In the year 2003, merely a year after its release, Morrowind secured a place in the top 10 best-selling games for Xbox. Let that sink in for a moment. It stood proudly alongside a juggernaut like Halo the only other game to achieve such a feat. That's right, Morrowind proved to be an absolute powerhouse, captivating players across platforms and leaving a lasting impression on the gaming world. From this point forward, Todd Howard was considered the golden child of Bethesda, but has our golden child gotten better at his very first job of ridding us of those pesky bugs? No, he didn't, and GameSpy made sure that he was aware of it. They said the game was buggy, repetitive, and just plain boring. They were wrong. Everyone says they were wrong. This game received critical review from other platforms as well as from other community members and left everybody with a very fond gaming memory. At this point in the timeline, Bethesda is about to enter a golden age. But before we talk about that, I want to invite you into helping me reach a golden age of my own. If you're liking the video here, do not be afraid to hit that like button and make sure you subscribe. That way you can keep up to date on any new videos that I'm releasing. This marks the beginning of the golden age of Bethesda, and this is a really good clear-cut mark to do that because Oblivion got the legendary Patrick Stewart to do some voice acting, and he's not the only one. We'll go into that a little bit more in the future. Makes me wonder how Todd did this. Wait, where's Todd? Oblivion, the brainchild of Ashley Cheng and Ken Rolston, marked a dramatic transformation from its predecessor. Jeremy Soul's magnificent music set the perfect tone for this immersive adventure. With improved technology, Bethesda aimed to deliver a game with a captivating story, memorable characters, and exciting quests. Say goodbye to the mundane task like fetching bread for Nana. In their quest for believability, all NPCs were voiced, boasting an exceptional cast of talent. Oblivion was a bold step forward, raising the bar for immersive gaming experiences. Bethesda really stepped up the voice acting game in Oblivion. Not only was every NPC line of dialogue voiced, but also the star power they had behind it. Sir Patrick Stewart, Linda Carter, Terrence Stamp, and let's not forget the great Sean Bean Machine were all in this game. I do think they may have went a little over budget getting these stars in the game though, because every other NPC sounds like it was voiced by either one guy or one other gal. I got my first taste of Oblivion when I was sleeping over at a friend's house one day and I was instantly hooked and I definitely was not the only one. In a little over a month, Oblivion sold 1.7 million copies. 
Welcome to the big leagues, Bethesda. In my personal opinion, I think Oblivion was actually the pinnacle of the Elder Scrolls series. This was the best one. However, they still committed one major sin that still haunts us to this day. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about the horse armor. Everybody boo Bethesda for this one. Boo! boo! In the Tetris lands of Tamriel, your trusty horse becomes your valued companion. And hey, you want the absolute best for your beloved steed, right? Well, how about splurging on the finest horse armor money can buy for a mere tree fitty? Wait, hold on a second. No, you sneaky Loch Ness monster. I'm not giving you tree fitty. Besides, it was being sold for $2.50. Let's be real. The armor didn't even provide any real protection. It was nothing more than a cosmetics cash grab. Typical Zenimax move, if you will. So yeah, fuck horse armor. The game was fantastic, but now we got to deal with microtransactions, and I don't know if that was a fair trade. Thanks, Bethesda. Oh yeah, and the game was super buggy. All right, that's enough orcs and elves for now. I'm American, it's almost the 4th of July, so let's talk about some things that we love, and that is guns, explosions, and killing commies. That's right, we're talking about Fallout 3. Democracy is non-negotiable. Guess who's back at the helm? That's right, it's Todd Howard. So that's what he was doing. Bethesda, determined not to be a one-trick pony, acquired this universe from Interplay Entertainment, and boy, did they shake things up. Say goodbye to the XCOM-style tactics game, because we're now diving headfirst into a post-apocalyptic oblivion, but with guns and radiation. Talk about a wild genre mashup. Real quick aside, everyone. I'm more fantasy than I am guns and freedom when it comes to my games. Luckily for Bethesda, and honestly Activision as well, everyone else seems to disagree. There's no denying it, this game completely obliterated Oblivion's first week sales, with an astonishing increase of over 57%. The flood of praise and awards for this title was so overwhelming that even I found myself getting caught up in this mesmerizing brown and green world. Bethesda was now hitting their stride, showcasing their impeccable world-building skills. Of course, there were a few naysayers who voiced their discontent with how far the game had deviated from the source material, but hey, you can't please everyone, right? It's not a Fallout game. It's not even a game inspired by Fallout as I had hoped. It's a game that contains a loose assortment of familiar Fallout concepts and names. Electricity, pre-war electronic equipment, powered and still working computers, just think about that for a second, working cola and snack machines, weapons, ammo, scrap metal, needed by many, and even unlooted first aid boxes are everywhere. Vance D, Weller, long time no mutants. Now, apart from some haters who were diehard fans of Fallout 1 and 2, Fallout 3 was very well recepted. In fact, it was the golden standard for Bethesda games to come and really showed everybody in the gaming industry how it's done. They were already a big name with the success of Oblivion, but the success of Fallout 3 really solidified Bethesda as a big game maker. And being a big game maker, you're able to get some big name voice actors to come in. They chose the legendary Ron Perlman to be the voice of the narrator, I wouldn't choose anybody else, and Liam Neeson to play yo daddy. But old habits do die hard and Bethesda really loves their bugs. Even though the wasteland is filled with radiation, this place is still infested. The worst spot was actually on the PlayStation 3, but that console has seen a lot of problems with other games as well, so it could have just been that problematic console. Nonetheless, players were absolutely encapsulated by this new world and the new story that they were being given that we were able to let the bug slide on this one too, yet again giving Bethesda another free pass. At this point here, we are nearing peak Bethesda performance, and there's one game that absolutely quantifies that. It does not need an introduction, but I'm going to give it one anyways. This is quite possibly the best game that has ever been released. It is the dead horse that has been beaten to a pulp, and the source of all memes from 2011 through 2020, and that game is Skyrim. Skyrim took the gaming world by storm on 11, 11 of 11. Under the guidance of Todd Howard, development went smoothly, resulting in a once-in-a-decade masterpiece. 
that garnered universal appeal and praise. Within a week of its release, Skyrim sold a staggering 7 million copies. Despite utilizing the same engine, significant upgrades made the world visually stunning, complementing its captivating storytelling. Bethesda's mastery of world building was on full display once again for Todd Howard and the entire team. Skyrim remains their magnum opus, a testament to their unmatched creativity and expertise. So I will say that Skyrim did become a cash cow that Bethesda milked the shit out of. However, it could have just been a circumstance of the time that Skyrim was released. The game was still relevant due to mods. We had VR technology come out and we had next gen consoles coming out. So Skyrim was re-released for a remastered version as well as a VR version. However, Bethesda didn't miss the humor in this situation, and they actually released a version of Skyrim jokingly on the uh, Amazon Alexa, and even made the jokes of making it available for the TI-89 calculator. Skyrim was a massive success with very few issues. While there were some detractors, they were vastly outnumbered by the game's enthusiastic fans. Like any open game world, there were still some bugs, but they were mostly minor and didn't disrupt the overall performance. The PlayStation 3 version had the most issues, which was a recurring theme for the console. The impact of Skyrim can still be felt today, with games like Breath of the Wild and Valheim drawing on inspiration from it. One could argue that the game even sparked a renewed interest in Viking history. With the abundance of memes, mods, and merchandise that emerged from Skyrim, Bethesda seemed invincible and on top of their game. Our time in Skyrim is almost over, but before we move on, I wanted to show you one more thing, and that was the sheer quality of the collector's edition that you had received. This will come up later in the video, but I also wanted to go show off one of my most prized possessions. Meet Alduin. This statue had come in the collector's edition that I had purchased back in 2011. He is my most prized possession, and I definitely do not regret making that purchase. The sheer quality and the high, high detail of this model really shows how much Bethesda put love and care into the Skyrim franchise, but we're done with that for now. Let's go and talk about Fallout 4. Fallout 4, by most people's standards, would be the first stumble block that Bethesda has come across. In 2015, there was a certain kind of hate culture that video game industry was going through where people thought it was popular to hate things that everybody loved. I personally think that has a big factor in why this game was considered the first stumble. Sure, the game did have its fair share of bugs and issues, Nick being one of the biggest ones, but in my opinion, the game was still fantastic. It was definitely far from a terrible game. Fallout 4 took everybody by surprise with its sudden announcement. There was no lengthy advertisements or teasers, just a big announcement that Fallout 4 was on its way. And to keep us entertained while we waited, Bethesda released a fun little game called Fallout Shelter. This mobile game allowed players to simulate life in a vault and do their best to keep those dwellers alive. It was incredibly enjoyable, offering unique gameplay that stood out in the mobile market. While microtransactions were present, they absolutely were not necessary to enjoy the game. Personally, I'm a big fan of this little gem. Fallout 4 did introduce significant changes to the Fallout formula. Some of them were very well received. For example, the way power armor worked in this game, it was more of an exosuit that would go over your armor that you'd wear for a day-to-day -day basis, and then you could run that mech suit around, feeling the world shake between your boots. Very powerful, very nice. But one other change was not nearly as well received, and that was the voice acting of the player character and the protagonist of the game. Ken Ralston was once quoted saying, I prefer Morrowind's partially recorded dialogue for many reasons, but I'm told that the fully voiced dialogue is what the kids want. Expressing his perspective on the inclusion of fully voiced NPCs. This response may come across as a bit old fashioned, but not in the derogatory manner. However, the fully voiced dialogue wasn't the only aspect that threw the players off in Fallout 4. The dialogue wheel, where have I seen this before? It didn't always align with players' expectations resulting in the protagonist being sassy when the players didn't intend for them to be. Additionally, the game suffered from more severe bugs than before. Nick, stop swimming in the air. You're embarrassing me in front of the cool kids. The main plot of Fallout 4 was considered the weakest of among Bethesda's release, and Preston with his radiant quests often requires mods to get him to shut the fuck up. Despite those flaws being noticeable, this game was so finely crafted that they could be easily overlooked. With a vast and immersive world to explore, players found themselves captivated for weeks on end. 
The game overall was incredible. However, there was one controversy that hit the modding community where it really hurt, and that was the Bethesda Creation Club. In 2015, Bethesda introduced the concept of paid mods, which was met with significant backlash from the gaming community. Players saw this move as a heavy-handed money grab and a breach of trust. You see, mods have always been a crucial aspect of Bethesda games, not only enhancing and fixing the issues that the games have, but keeping the games fresh long after their release. A prime example of this is Skyrim, which is still one of the top 200 games streamed on Twitch, despite being released 12 years ago. Due to the public outcry, Bethesda eventually abandoned the idea of paid mods. However, they proceeded with the development of the Creation Club, a modding platform created and controlled by the company itself. While the Creation Club allowed Bethesda to monetize modders in a more controlled manner, some players remained skeptical and saw it as a compromise that didn't fully address their concerns about the free modding community. The Creation Club has been a sus subject of debate and controversy among fans and modders ever since its inception. Bethesda's assertion that the Creation Club is not just paid mods has caused contention within the community. I can see both sides of it. Bethesda wants to create a place where modders can submit their work that way it can be approved by the company, and then they can get a profit for their hard work, if they so desire. Completely understand that. That is very generous of Bethesda. However, there is a slice of greed within that. When you go to the Creation Club, you do have to buy in-client currency, which means Bethesda, somewhere along the line, is getting a slice of this money, which is not okay. That is greedy. Another unintended consequence of the Creation Club actually did hit PC players the most. When Skyrim was originally released, you could go onto your Steam account, go to the workshop, and download mods directly from Steam itself. They would install it for you, make sure it worked properly, and tell you what else you needed to install in order to get these mods to work. It made modding easy, it made it fast, and it made it fun. Well, with the Creation Club, Bethesda said, you ain't doing that anymore. They took that out of there. You can no longer use the workshop for Skyrim Remastered or for Fallout 4. This caused the modding to be more frustrating and more confusing and just overall a negative experience. As Bethesda continued its march through time, it was being watched a little bit closer. The community had some serious concerns about corporate greed that was either stemming from Bethesda themselves or ZeniMax Studios, which is hard to tell if you don't have any insider knowledge. But one thing that was not hard to tell was the shift of practices that Bethesda had from previous entries. This led to the downfall of Bethesda. The biggest thing that was a change was the inclusion of paid mods and the creation club. This was seen as an attempt to monetize something that was traditionally free and freely shared between each other within the modded community. This led to a lack of trust within Bethesda from its closest fans. It had been about three years since Fallout 4 was released, as well as some extra releases of Skyrim and Fallout 4. We finally got Bethesda's first big slip up. Yeah, we're going to talk about 76 now. Fallout 76, much like Fallout 4, was a game that seemed to come out of nowhere. Announced abruptly and met with skepticism from the start, when the game was released, it became evident that this was far from what the fans had been hoping for. It was plagued with numerous issues and received a lukewarm reception at best. One of the major departures from the previous Fallout games was the absence of non-playable characters or NPCs which left the game feeling empty and devoid of meaningful interactions. The leveling system also underwent a significant change, relying on card packs that introduced a sense of randomness and uncertainty. Microtransactions were introduced into Fallout 76, allowing players to purchase in-game items for real money. This decision, coupled with the steep prices for certain items, drew criticism from the community, who felt that Bethesda was prioritizing monetization over player satisfaction. $20 for a Santa suit? Fuck off, Bethesda! Perhaps one of the most notable problems for Fallout 76 was the abundance of bugs and technical glitches. Players encountered a multitude of issues that hindered their enjoyment and often disrupted gameplay. To add to the disappointment, Bethesda faced backlash when they banned players for using mods intended to fix the game's problems. This decision was seen as misguided and the company seemed more concerned with protecting their image than addressing the game's fundamental flaws. I approached 76 with a healthy dose of skepticism and disbelief. And unfortunately in this time, I was proven correct. 
Trust me, I love being right. I really do. But in this one scenario, I wish I was wrong. It was clear that this game was rushed and pushed out as quickly as possible to capitalize as much on the market as they could. There were some major aspects of this game that were lacking and noticeable. For example, the reuse of assets. You could find the reuse of assets within Fallout 4 bring brought right into 76. Almost everything was reused, actually. There wasn't very many unique things that were made during this game. Another thing that was unique about this game was the lack of NPCs, which was a terrible decision. It gave you a very unlively world. It was like you were within this wasteland all alone, nobody there. And the bugs, oh my God, don't get me started on the bugs. There was an absolute infestation in this game. At launch, it was almost unplayable. But you know what wasn't unplayable? The microtransaction store, baby, because Bethesda chose to polish their microtransaction store to get as much money as possible instead of polishing this game to make it work. Even Todd Howard, during his opening speech on how this game was made, lacked his enthusiasm, lacked his reasoning behind it, which shows that this game was rushed and it was not given the proper attention that it deserved to be a Fallout game. As we indicated earlier, the parent company ZeniMax may have also pushed for Fallout 76 to be released as quickly as possible. There was a need for a live service game within Bethesda's repertoire that would support online monetization and microtransactions. And what better universe to do that in than their most successful franchise, which is the Fallout universe. So either it was Bethesda or ZeniMax that was corporate greeting their way into pushing this game and getting it sent out as unprepared as possible. Overall, this was a major disappointment to a lot of Fallout fans, especially the ones who were looking for a multiplayer entry into the series and looked very poorly and hurt Bethesda's reputation tremendously. Despite the initial flaws and negative reception, one commendable aspect of Bethesda's approach to 76 is their commitment to improving the game and addressing player feedback. Similar to Hello Games' approach with No Man's Sky, Bethesda chose not to abandon Fallout 76, but instead continued to work on it to fulfill their promises and make the game more playable. With the release of the Wastelanders DLC and the subsequent Brotherhood of Steel DLC, I personally returned to the game and found that it had significantly improved. Many of the bugs and technical issues that plagued the game at launch have been resolved, resulting in a smoother and more enjoyable experience. One notable addition was the introduction of private servers. Although it came with a premium pay plan, while not perfect, the feature allowed players to have more control over their gameplay experience and enhance their enjoyment of the game. The inclusions of NPCs in Fallout 76 through the Wastelanders DLC was a significant step forward. NPCs add depth and richness to the game world, making it feel more authentic and in line with the immersive stellar storytelling the fans have come to expect from the Fallout universe. So now that they got the gameplay of Fallout 76 settled, that means the game's fine, right? And had no more controversies. Wrong. The biggest controversy was in the physical space. Now, I showed you my Collector's Edition Aldwin to show you the quality of Collector's Editions that Bethesda used to release. Well, for Fallout 76, they did really well on the helmet that you would get that had lights and sounds that was modeled after the power armor of the game. However, they had a major slip up in the bags. They were intended to give a canvas bag that you could store all your goodies in, but people actually ended up getting nylon bags. When this complaint was originally lifted to Bethesda, they were very dismissive and not very professional with their resolution. They tried to give people $5 in their Atom store in a game that was buggy and damn near unplayable at the time. Of course, eventually Bethesda, under the complaints of the, of the customer, did relent and start sending out the canvas bags to those who signed up for it on their site with proof of purchase. However, the damage had already been done. Their loyal fan base had already been disenfranchised and insulted that Bethesda would try to pass off these nylon bags as if they were good enough for the canvas that were promised. It's good to keep in mind that these kinds of controversies, either it be bugs in a game or some collector's items missing or needing being replaced, is common within the gaming industry and is not entirely unpreventable. But what the most important part is how the customer feels and how the customer service is rendered. At this time, Bethesda shown that they did not care for their customers' complaints and they did not care to honor the promises that they had made. The fall of Bethesda certainly encompasses Fallout 76. I'm just glad that they were able to keep the Elder Scrolls out of the whole controversy. 
Yeah, I forgot about you. Bethesda's second mobile release, The Elder Scrolls Blades, took place in the Elder Scrolls universe, specifically between the events of Oblivion and Skyrim. Unfortunately, it fell short of expectations. The game was heavily plagued with microtransactions, which significantly impacted the gameplay experience. The gameplay itself was deemed boring and limited, lacking the depth and engagement that the fans had come to expect from the franchise. Additionally, the story failed to captivate players, leaving them unimpressed. The reception of The Elder Scrolls Blades was predominantly negative, with many considering it another disappointing release from Bethesda. It served as a stark reminder of the company's downward trend in terms of game quality and player satisfaction. The mobile title failed to capture the essence and magic of The Elder Scrolls series, leaving fans longing for immersive experiences they had come to cherish from the previous installments. After a gap of about 8 years, Bethesda has really been quiet on the front. It seems like they took that shot to their ego from 76 and really started to work on some of the problems that they had, starting with their game engine. Damn, that thing was old. But major news did appear in 2021 when Microsoft announced they were going to buy out the parent studio, ZeniMax, thus making Bethesda back in their home plate at Xbox as an exclusive game developer. Don't worry, they'll release on PC as well. This news was very exciting for the fans. With the renewed partnership with Microsoft, Bethesda now has access to a whole new slew of resources that they did not have before, meaning they can make games better than they ever have. The next game that Bethesda has keyed up to go, and they've been working on it since back in like 2016, is Starfield. We've seen a lot about this game, and from what I've seen, it absolutely has the potential to be a turning point for Bethesda. This partnership that Microsoft has done has been will be great for both of them. Microsoft needed exclusives to compete with PlayStation. PlayStation has a lot of great exclusives, including God of War Ragnarok, which released earlier this year. So with Bethesda having the pedigree that they have, Microsoft now has a competitive edge against PlayStation. And Microsoft also has a ton of resources uh, other game studios that Bethesda can collaborate with and create even better games. Fans, including myself, are very excited about this development. We absolutely want to see Bethesda turn this around and go back to the glory days of Skyrim and Oblivion and Fallout 3 and Fallout 4. These are the days that we're looking forward to again. As we await the release of Starfield, it remains uncertain what the future holds for Bethesda as a company. Many fans, including myself, approach the company with caution due to the mistakes they have made in the past. However, glimpses of Starfield have been promising, and there is hope that Bethesda has learned from the blunders of other developers. From what I have seen, Starfield appears to be Bethesda's interpretation of a game like No Man's Sky. The concept and potential scope of the game are intriguing. However, given the initial controversies and disapprovements surrounding No Man's Sky's release, it is crucial for Bethesda to take notes and avoid repeating the similar missteps. Ultimately, the true quality and reception of Starfield will only be known once the game is released. Fans are eagerly anticipating its launch, hoping that Bethesda has taken the time to refine their ideas, address past shortcomings, and deliver a game that lives up to expectations. The success of Starfield could potentially shape the trajectory of Bethesda as a company and determine their future standing in the game industry. With Todd at the helm of this game, there's a very good chance that he's going to be able to steer this ship right and create another fantastic game, but ultimately only time will tell whether or not Bethesda can reclaim their former glory and get back to the good old days. But what are your thoughts? Do you think Starfield has the potential to restore Bethesda back to its former glory days? Or are you bracing yourself for more disappointment from the once beloved studio? I invite you to put your thoughts in the comments below. In the meantime, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that this game is going to be great. This has been Roan Farrow, and if you found this video to be educational or entertaining, feel free to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next one.